Well, again, to our guests, I'm, I'm uh, very glad you're here this morning, and uh, we're going to do something uh, a little bit d- different today. Uh, normally, we have been walking through the Gospel of John uh, since last uh, August, but today I've decided to uh, talk about something um, that's uh, very sensitive, uh, a, a very con- uh, temporary, sensitive social issue, which is something that I, I feel like we'll need to do from time to time, uh, depending on what kinds of things are happening in the world. Um, and I'm largely deciding to do this because of the ongoing uh, media discussions that, that compel me to make sure that we as a church are equipped to understand with the mind and to respond Uh, in our actions to the multifaceted world in which we are called to shine the light of Jesus Christ. And and in in light of some very complex uh, social issues, uh, I would like to do my best to make sure that our our understanding and our response is biblical. Biblical in the sense that we are faithful to God's assessment uh, of these things, according to what his word says, and biblically faithful in the sense that we are uh, responding to the things that are happening in our society in a way that reflects the compassionate love of Jesus Christ. Uh, So I care about biblical thinking, and I care about biblical living. I care about truth, and I care about compassionate love when it comes to the topic of homosexuality. So if you're a guest with us today... I'd like to welcome you to the hornet's nest of this issue, and, uh, and we're, we're going to go there today. Um, in, in light of that, where I've talked to all of, in case you're wondering, I've talked to all the parents with kids, and so they all knew that this was coming. So um, let me just go ahead and pray and uh, ask for God's help, and if you would join me in, in pleading with him for that. Lord, we, we thank you for this time. We thank you that Your uh, word is what we need to navigate the complexities of the world in which we live. I pray that I would speak the truth in love, and I pray that we could rightly understand and respond rightly in light of what we are taught in the gospel about the way that you have loved us. And so uh, give us great grace today, we pray in Jesus' name. Well, as you're all very aware we're living in a time of considerable trans, uh, transition uh, in our culture regarding the public opinion on issues of gender and sexuality. And while there are countless issues related to gender and sexuality that we could focus on, I'm going to focus on the one that uh, I think is perhaps the most pressing, and at least it's among the most pressing in need of some sort of... Um, Uh, discussion in light of the public discussion that's taking place on the issue. And so we're going to talk about the very relevant issue of homosexuality. So I'm going there. (laughs) And I would ask for you to please give me grace as I do. Uh, Everybody knows that we need to talk about this. Uh, Everybody knows that it's very tricky to talk about this. And uh, so please hear me out. Because in all likelihood, there is something in here to offend every one of us. And I'd like to just ask you to, to hear me out, because when it's all said and done, I hope, that, I hope we're helped by this. Uh, I think we will be. So please give me some grace, because we're, we're heading there. Um, and we're heading there because it, it's, it's becoming clearer, clearer than ever, I think, that there's a mounting inertia behind the public support of the social and political and ethical acceptance of homosexual actions, uh, homosexual affections and actions in the United States. Our our nation has embarked on on a new way of thinking about sexuality and marriage uh, and family and the world in which our children will grow up in is going to uh, be a very different world than the world that most of us grew up in in many ways with regards to, to, to these things because things are drastically changing and it's actually happening, happening very, very quickly. Um, let me read to you an excerpt from an op-ed written by a man named Frank Bruni 
who's an openly uh, homosexual uh, columnist for the New York Times. And in March of 2013, so this is already two years old, uh, he wrote in his piece entitled Marriage and the Supremes, he wrote about this very quick shift in public opinion. And here's what he says. He says, in an astonishingly brief period of time, this country has experienced a seismic shift in opinion, a profound social and political revolution when it comes to gay and lesbian people. In 2008, both Clinton and Barack Obama publicly opposed same-sex marriage. 2008, they both publicly opposed same-sex marriage. Just a year ago, so this was 2013 when it was written, so sometime in early 2012, that was still Obama's formal stance. But by the summer of 2012, so that was March to summer of 2012, marriage equality had made its way into the party platform. Now it's woven into the party's very fiber. In an ABC News World, uh, Washington Post survey released early last week in 2013, respondents, this is still a quote, respondents nationwide favored marriage equality by a 58 to 36 margin. That's an exact flip of a similar survey just seven years ago, which is, what, 2008? When the margin was 36 to 58. Okay. So the, the, the point is that things are shifting very quickly. Everybody, can, everybody recognizes that. Um, the public opinion is shifting very quickly, which probably isn't a surprise to most of us if you've had... If you've, had any sense of the pulse of culture for the last 10 to 20 years. This is not really surprising. You've probably seen it taking place. In recent years, however, and th this, this kind of took me off guard personally, uh, you've not, we've not only seen a shift in the public opinion about the issue, but there's a shift uh, in a, uh, there, there's a, there's a consequent criticism that comes with the shift. Those who have shifted their opinions, there's also a criticism that has developed as well, and it's this. If you believe that homosexuality is morally wrong, just as our president, for example, believed in his first term, um, you are a bigot. You're, a, you're hateful. You're the equivalent of a, of a racist. Here's Kevin DeYoung's assessment of the situation. If you believe homosexual behavior is wrong and gay marriage is a contradiction in terms, you are fast becoming in the public eye not simply benighted but positively reprehensible like the last slave owner who refuses to get on the right side of history. Now I've heard a lot of that type of rhetoric, rhetoric uh, personally and I, I believe that it's becoming increasingly uh, amplified and it concerns me and it doesn't concern me because I think that it's a valid criticism it, it doesn't concern me because uh, not, it's not, it concerns me not because I'm obsessed with the culture war it concerns me not because I believe that the gays are taking America away from Jesus it doesn't concern me as though I believe that it's my life's mission to battle the homosexual agenda that is not my life's mission the main reason I'm concerned about the criticism is because if we don't challenge that criticism in our own minds, I'm actually afraid we might end up believing that it's true. We need to think about it. The rhetoric is very, very powerful, even if it's not logical. It's very powerful. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised at all this morning if there are some among us who are struggling with the tension between what we believe about homosexuality because this book teaches us about it and the fear that it might actually be hateful to believe what this book teaches. And if you're not struggling with that tension, then praise God for it because your kids probably will. They will have to navigate it. They will probably uh, or, or perhaps uh, potentially wonder at some point if the things that they have been taught in this book are hateful. And we have to help one another. We have to help our kids answer that question uh, correctly. 
Um, they've been entrusted to us to provide guidance for them. And so we, wanna, we want to uh, respond to this with thought. So here's what I want to do today. I want to make a very simple point from the scriptures for our sake, for the sake of our children, in response to the growing accusation of uh, hate. Um, and I'm not able, as I do that, to get into the many, many important questions that need to be addressed and talked about relating to this issue. So if you have complex questions about the relationship between church and state, or if you're looking for some sort of input on specific legislative questions regarding to the civic definition of marriage, or if you're wondering whether or not you can bank at Wells Fargo in light of Franklin Graham's uh, announcements this week, and you can, um, I'm not really going to satisfy that itch today. Uh, my point is simple but fundamental. I believe that it's easy enough for a child to grasp, and yet I think that it is worthy of our consideration, and it's this. If Christians disagree with the culture's opinion about the moral uh, status of homosexuality, it does not mean that we are uh, hateful. If I deem the activities of somebody to be immoral and contrary to God's design, it does not necessarily mean that I hate the people who are engaged in those activities. Now, qualifier, sadly, it is true that many Christians hate homosexuals, and it is unacceptable. That's true, and it's sad. And it's not okay for us to be that way. And so there is a need to repent of this in the Christian community. But it is not true that it is inevitably hateful to, do, to, to disagree with somebody else's moral position. And we and our children have to understand this because even though at one level this truth seems self-evident, the rhetoric that's coming at the Bible-loving Christian can sometimes be very confusing when your position is being framed in terms of slaveholder, right? And so we need to think about this and we need to understand that when God calls us to believe things that differ from the moral opinions of the majority culture, it does not automatically imply that we are hateful. And in fact, as we'll see, I think that God intends to use the disagreements for the sake of displaying his love through us to those whom we disagree with, although it may not look the way that you expect that it would. Okay. So I'm going to try to make a case for this. And I want to acknowledge right off the bat, I'm sorry, this might go a little bit long today, but it's very interesting. I think it's very important. And um, there you go. <clears throat> I want to acknowledge right off the bat, I'm working with some assumptions. I don't expect the world to share these assumptions uh, with me. Um, these are Christian assumptions. Uh, and I'm not talking to the world this morning. I'm speaking to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I'm going to share with you what my assumptions are. I think we hold these in common. Assumption number one, I assume that God exists. Not everybody shares that assumption, right? I, as I talk about this, I assume that God exists. I get it from the Bible. I'm not going to defend it. I'm just letting you know what my assumption is. Assumption number two, I believe that God has standards. Uh, I don't think that many people believe that. Um, because they don't believe that he exists, some people, right? Um, I'm not going to defend it. I'm getting it from the Bible. Uh, I'm just letting you know what my assumption is. God, God exists. God has standards. Uh, assumption number three. I assume that people and societies have some measure of intuitive awareness of God's standards. And I'm getting that from Romans chapter 2. And I'd like for you to turn there. I will, I will show you where this assumption comes from. Romans chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. Romans chapter 2, Paul is explaining that non-Jewish people, also known as Gentiles in the book of Romans, uh, did not have the law of Moses to tell them what God's standard was. Uh, they didn't have the law of Moses to teach them about what was right and what was Wrong, And yet, Gentiles, non-Jews, still had some awareness of God's standards because God had written it onto their 
hearts. Romans 2.14. For when Gentiles who do not have the law of Moses by nature do what the law of Moses requires, they are a law to themselves. Even though they do not have the law, they show that the work of the law, telling us what is right is wrong, telling us of what is right and wrong, the work of the law is written on their hearts while their conscience, and you may, if you're a, a Bible circling type, you may want to <laughs> circle that word right there, their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse and even excuse them. So Paul says that the law was, uh, that, that God was, um, has written the, the work of the law, is the phrase that he uses. He's, working the, he's written the work of the law uh, on the heart of the common man. And the instrument that he has given to humanity that enables us to know right from wrong is called the conscience. Conscience is like a moral nerve. And it helps us know if our actions are lining up with God's standards. Sometimes the conscience accuses us, tells us that what we're doing is not lining up with who God is or what God wants. And sometimes the conscience excuses us, helps us know that, yes, this is in fact a good thing that you're uh, doing. The conscience is one of the various means by which human beings discern what is right and what is wrong. Now, there's a lot more that we could say about the conscience. The fact that the conscience can be hardened, the fact that the conscience can be renewed through the Word of God, but I'm not going to get into that right now. My main point is simply to defend the third assumption that I'm making, and that's that people and societies have some measure of an intuitive awareness of what God's standards are, and the conscience is a God-given tool that helps us know to some limited extent the difference between what is right and what is wrong. So those are my first three assumptions. I assume that God exists. I assume that God has standards. And I assume that people and societies have some measure, often distorted, but some measure of intuitive awareness of what those standards are. And this is the biblical explanation for the concept of morality in society. This is where it comes from. This is the biblical explanation of why people uh, have some awareness of what's moral and what's immoral. This is why they make moral decisions, deem some things to be right, deem some things to be wrong. It's because God exists, he has standards, and we have some vague notion of what those standards are because of the conscience. Sometimes the conscience aligns us with God's perspective. Sometimes it, it, we're, we're totally off with God's perspective. But in either case, we have the equipment of a moral operating system built into the fabric of our souls. Human beings are moral beings and they make moral decisions about what is good and what is evil. And it's because of these three assumptions that I've laid out. Um, that's where morality comes from. Okay, assumption number four. I assume that God's standards are clearly articulated for us in the Bible, both confirming some of the moral values of a society and confronting other moral values of a society. So as people and societies make moral judgments, they say... For example, murder is wrong, or rape is wrong, or perhaps in some communist countries, uh, religion is a bad thing. I think those are moral type of decisions. As people and societies make moral judgments, they may or may not be aligned with the unshifting standards of God. So how do you ever know? How do you ever know if what your society is doing, morally speaking, is lined up with what God actually believes about it? Or how do you know if your moral nerve has gone haywire? How do you know? Well, I'm a Christian. And so that means that I believe that God has revealed his perspective, which I believe is truth, in the Bible. That the Bible is uh, where we take our cues. And whether society agrees with it or not, whether society is taking its cues from the Bible or rejecting the Bible, the Bible is my anchor point, and the Bible is the church's anchor point. 
And so some of what the Bible says, society is going to love, totally embrace, like love one another. Right? Not a lot of people who are arguing with that moral command. Love one another. Um, and some of what the Bible teaches, society is going to totally reject. Do not be drunk with wine. Okay? If I go down to Old Town last night after the, what was it, not New West Fest, it was a taste of Fort Collins. I went down to Fort Collins last night with my wife and uh, walked around a little bit after we had dinner, and people are loaded. And, uh, and if, if you say, do not be drunk with wine, uh, if I go around shouting that to everybody, you know, if I go around shouting like, love one another, love one another, people are like, that guy's crazy. But they're not like, you know, hater. Uh, <laughs> if, if, but, if, but if I'm like, be not drunk with wine, they're like, you know, stone him. You know? <laughs> no, they're probably not that, but... Um, just kind of depends on where a society's moral values are at any given moment in history, in any given society, because society's moral positions uh, change with time. So the Bible will line up sometimes, and it won't line up sometimes. Or maybe the better way to say it is people will line up sometimes, and people won't line up sometimes. Okay, so... I assume God exists. I assume God has moral standards. I, uh, uh, I assume that society has some awareness of what those standards are, although it's often distorted because the conscience doesn't always work well. And I believe that those standards are clearly articulated for us in the Bible. Those are my presuppositions as I now try to make the case that if you would disagree with a culture's moral opinion on an issue, it doesn't mean that you hate the people that you disagree with. Let me unpack it in three steps. If we disagree with our culture's moral opinion about the morality of homosexuality, it does not make you a hater. Let me explain step number one. First of all, Christians have to recognize that sexual affections and sexual activities are uh, moral issues. They're moral issues. Which is to say, sexual desires... And sexual actions should be thought of in terms of uh, right and wrong. And by the way, every society throughout history recognizes that fact. Sexual desires, sexual actions are universally evaluated by all societies throughout history according to standards of what is right and what is wrong. I'm unaware of any society that truly has zero sexual standards. All societies treat sex as a moral issue to some degree throughout the world. Throughout history, there are standards of what kinds of sexual desires and actions are acceptable in a given society. All societies care about this. In every society, there are some things that are considered good. There are some things that are considered bad. And even if differing societies or if differing people have differing opinions about what is right and what is wrong, nobody is saying, who cares? It's just sex. As though we're talking about paint colors. We, people care about sex. Societies care about who can have sex with whom. They always have and they always will because it's a moral issue and there's a deep intuitive awareness that you can get this one wrong. Is it acceptable to have sex with a stranger or with the spouse of another person? Those are moral questions. Societies have answers to those questions. Now, maybe differing answers, depending on the society, depending on the time. Is it acceptable to have sex with somebody of the same uh, gender? Well, you have different people on different pages on this issue right now. Is it acceptable to force somebody to have sex against their will or to touch them in sexual ways without their permission? Is that right or is that wrong? Societies have answers for those kinds of questions. 
Is it acceptable to have sex with multiple partners to prepare for marriage? Under what circumstances is sex good and right and permissible and acceptable and good or bad? These are moral questions, deeply important questions that all societies answer in terms of right and wrong. And therefore, when we come to the topic of homosexual desire and homosexual activity, we are within the realm of the larger discussion of sexual ethics. It's a discussion that may include more than morality, but it certainly includes nothing less than the moral discussion. The discussion may include social issues, it may include political issues, but they are social and political issues that deal with a topic that is deeply and universally and intuitively handled uh, as a moral issue. What's right in this case? What's right and what's wrong? And though our current trajectory in the United States may be touted as the next step in our enlightened social and political progress, we Christians at least need to remember and we need to help our children understand that there are massive moral issues underneath the social and political uh, changes that are taking place. And that's why it's not as simple as just jumping on board and celebrating the developments that are taking place as though it's simply a matter of civil or social or political advancement. We're talking about celebrating something that many people regard as being deeply immoral, right? So it's not merely about breaking a tradition. It's not merely about breaking a social barrier. Because, and this is my first step in the argument, sexual affections and sexual activities are moral issues. Does that make sense? We're dealing with a moral issue. Second step in the argument. Responsible Bible-loving Christians will not share the culture's growing moral approval of homosexual actions and activity. Responsible Bible-loving Christians will not share our culture's growing moral approval of homosexual actions, uh, affections, rather, and activity. Now, I don't mean that in a belligerent way. I am not trying to be aggressive uh, about that. I'm not trying to be harsh, and I am in no way belittling the complexities that occur in the life of someone who is wrestling with their sexual uh, identity. Okay, from what I know from friends and acquaintances who either are or were living in a homosexual lifestyle, many people who feel a homosexual same-sex desire experience those desires as spontaneously and unforced as heterosexuals feel desire for people of the opposite sex. It just happens. It's just there. They just feel it. They're just attracted to people of the same sex. And it feels like they're born that way. Now, I don't know whether or not that's true. I don't know whether or not that's been proven. But it feels that way to them. They're not just trying to feel it. It's just rising up within them the same way that a heterosexual in this room feels drawn to the opposite sex. It's just there. And so when they hear that the Bible doesn't approve of those desires that are just there, it confronts something that feels very inherent to their very personhood. I want you to feel that for them. How confusing, how difficult, how scared would you be if that was your situation? If that was your struggle, put yourself in their shoes. It's very confusing. And by the way, it happens with Christians. Perhaps people in this very room. It's real. It's it's a malfunction that's happening in the heart that's very real. So put yourself in their shoes. We need to have compassion on people who are in that situation because it is a very perplexing and a very tumultuous journey that they have to walk. And the fear, the fear of sharing with Christians that you're 
attracted to people of the same sex would be excruciating. I mean, you thought it was hard for you to share with your gospel community that you're struggling with anger. Can you imagine what it would be like? Many people who feel same-sex attraction feel very, very alone because they're deathly afraid of what will happen if they share that struggle with a Bible-believing Christian. I went to school with multiple men who felt that attraction, and they believed that it was sin. They were Bible-loving Christian men. And my question is, is whether or not the church is a safe place for a man like that. Or a woman like that? Will they receive the same compassion and care as someone who struggles with anger? Or someone who struggles with pornography? Or someone who struggles with an eating disorder? Will they? The answer, I see Elon back there going, no, they won't. Okay, that's a problem. It's a problem. It's a very multifaceted and a very difficult issue. I'm just trying to help you taste like the hurt and the complexity. So that when I say that a responsible, Bible-loving Christian will not share the culture's moral approval of homosexual affections and activity, I want you to know I'm not trying to make it out to be a simple issue. It is not a simple issue. It's a very complex and confusing issue. There are hosts of psychological and spiritual and relational and social and political issues that have to be navigated very carefully in light of the position that the Bible tells us to take. And those are topics for a different day because I just can't try to navigate all of those things. I'm just, under, I'm just trying to... Uh, explain to you and help you understand and, and share with you that I, I, I understand that this, this is a very complex issue, okay? And yet, for the sake of what I am trying to accomplish, I need to not only acknowledge that homosexuality is a moral issue, but despite all the unanswered and complicated questions that it brings up, I need to say that the Bible provides instructions for how Christians ought to think about the morality of homosexuality, and the Bible simply does not share the moral opinion of the majority right now. Um, and it's not a strange thing that the Bible doesn't share the moral opinion of the majority. The Bible says lots of things about sex that aren't going to be accepted by the uh, majority. Okay? That's always been the case. The Bible has a lot of things to say about sex because the authors of the Bible were dealing with uh, sexual malfunctions in their own cultures. There were sexual malfunctions in Rome. There are sexual malfunctions in Corinth. There were sexual malfunctions in uh, Canaan. There are sexual malfunctions in Israel. And the Bible is addressing those things. There are malfunctions or deviations from God's God's design right here in America. The Bible does not condone uh, society's view of premarital sex, for example. It doesn't condone society's view of pornography or casual sex or any number of other popular sexual desires and activities. In fact, there are probably deviations from God's design for sex existing in the hearts and the, or, or the histories and or the histories of everybody in this room, right? We're all experiencing the reality of a sexual brokenness. Uh, and to some extent, when God confronted us, about our sexual deviations, whatever they may be or have been, it brought up a whole host of complicated issues for us as well, didn't it? Uh, I don't know about you, but when I realized that Jesus Christ is Lord and that he had standards for my life and for my sexuality, that it had some implications for the life that I had been living, and it brought up some issues. We all are battling against desires for things that he says that we can't have. That's part of the Christian's perilous journey through the world. It's not a strange thing for for God to disagree with society's opinions on moral issues. His word is full of corrective guidance for us, and therefore it's not a strange thing for Christians who hold to God's opinion to hold an opinion that is out of line with the moral opinion of the majority. We are a Bible-believing people. That's where we take our cues 
our conscience, our radar uh, for what is right and what is wrong. It's shaped by what we read in the scripture so that regardless of what our peers think, regardless of what our parents think, regardless of what our elected officials think, regardless of what the uh, media thinks, regardless of what our coworkers think, and in fact, regardless of what we ourselves once thought, the Bible is very willing to um, tune us in to a different position. That's just part of who we are as Christians. It makes us a bit strange to others because we're not blown around with every wind of new thinking that blows over the moral horizon of our generation. We are anchored into something that doesn't change from generation to generation. Uh, we're, we, we've not changed on the issue of homosexuality and, uh, for the past 2,000 years. Until very recently, it was the unanimous conclusion of all churches, Eastern, Catholic, liberal, Protestant, uh, you name it, the unanimous decision uh, on this topic was, was that this is, not a, this is not what God wants for people. Um, and that's the reason is because that's what the scripture teaches. Now, I don't have time to make a watertight case for it, but I am going to show you I am going to show you one place where it's quite plain what God's opinion is on the issue. And again, I'm not doing it for the purpose of, of being indignant. It's not driven by homophobia or malicious intent. I'm just trying to take my cues from the Bible on this issue because that's what Christians do with moral issues. They go to the text. Uh, and also, I just want you to know we're not just pulling it out of thin air. We have, there is actually some basis behind what we're trying to say. So go to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Paul is explaining that there are some things about God that are evident in the world. People have failed to recognize this about God. People have failed to recognize and honor God. Let me read, starting in verse 19 of chapter 1 of the book of Romans. What can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made, so they are without excuse, okay? The creation puts God on display. Verse 21. For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. God's, up. God's on display through creation. People have seen the reality of God through creation, but they haven't honored Him. Verse 22. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged. Now, that's another word you might want to circle if you're the type that writes in your Bible. They exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Okay. Rather than valuing God for who he is, they exchanged the treasure of God for some other treasure. Verse 24, therefore, I would underline that. There's something happened in light of that exchange. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their heart to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged, there it is again, they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Now, what this is saying is that there's a terrible exchange that has taken place. People are worshiping created things rather than God, and we're all guilty of this. Every single one of them, or every single one of us, are guilty of this idolatrous exchange of the glory of God for created things. We love things more than we love God. And the consequence of exchanging the truth about God for a lie. The consequence of worshiping the creature rather than the creator is in verse 24. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. Okay, so because of the exchange of the glory of God for an alternative, God has allowed some people in judgment to experience a malfunction of desire resulting in activity that's dishonoring to their own bodies. Now, what is the dishonoring activity. What specifically is the dishonoring bodily activity 
that people are engaged in as a judgment resulting from exchanging the glory of God for idols, verse 26. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions for their women exchanged. I would circle it again. There's a reason that Paul uses the same word. They exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. Okay, as a result of exchanging God's glory, some women end up exchanging their sexual relationships for something other than what they are naturally designed for. Okay, they engage in lesbian relationships. Verse 27, And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with a passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. And that's the Bible's very challenging assessment of homosexuality. And it's the Bible's theological explanation of homosexuality. People have exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and as a result, the truth of uh, as a result, God has given some people over to dishonorable passions so that they've exchanged natural relationships for unnatural relationships. And what this means is that the Bible teaches that homosexuality is a parable that demonstrates that something has gone terribly wrong in the world. Rather than things being the way that they ought to be, people have exchanged the intended design for something so that they might have something else that is abnormal, or to use Paul's language in verse 26, contrary to nature. And they are engaged in something, verse 28, that ought not to be done. Homosexuality is a parable about something that we are all guilty of. We have all exchanged the glory of God for things that ought not to be worshipped. And the fact is, homosexuality is a parable, therefore, of my problem and your problem. It's a picture of what's gone wrong inside of us. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. We have all exchanged the glory of God for creative things. We have all done what ought not to be done. We have all been idolaters, and homosexuality draws a picture of it. God has given some people over to this desire, and when we see it, we're supposed to look at that and say, there's something that's not right about this, and it testifies to the fact that there's something not right about us, all of us. Now, I don't expect, at this point in history, in America, that people who reject Jesus in the Bible are going to like this at all, okay? I don't want to hatefully and hurtfully beat anybody over the head with it. Do not take this and go start beating up, you know, people telling them that their life looks like a picture of an idolatry carnival. I don't want to hurt anybody with it. But it is the perspective that the Bible commands me to take. And so that's my conclusion. That's God's conclusion. That's my conclusion. It's not right. This isn't God's design for sexual affections and activity. He doesn't affirm that it's good. And what we need to understand loud and clear is that it is not hatred to believe Romans chapter 1. It's not hatred. Which brings us to the third step. Our difference of opinion on this or any other moral issue does not necessarily imply hatred for homosexuals or supporters of homosexuals. Okay. Hate, hatred is not a logical implication of what Romans 1 teaches. In fact, rather than hatred, the Bible actually teaches that Christians must love people who are engaged in immorality. This is not a contradiction. You can look at somebody's life, you can see that they have immoral desires, you can see that they're making immoral choices, completely disagree with their system of values, and you can even caringly share your assessment of their life with them under appropriate circumstances, and you can simultaneously, deeply, 
deeply love them. Those two things can exist simultaneously. Ask any parent who's watched their teenage child self-destruct in drugs and alcohol. You can intensely disagree with somebody's moral activities and have incredible love for them. And friends, that's Christianity 101. Romans 5.8. God shows His love for us and that while we were still sinners... While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Before we knew him, Jesus had lots of problems with our moral positions and our moral activities. But that didn't mean that he was withholding love for us. That didn't mean that Jesus is a, is a hater. He loved us when we were at the height of our disagreement with one another. I was in sin. Jesus knew that I was in sin. And he disagreed with me about my opinions and my affections and my lifestyle with regards to millions of issues. And yet he loved me while I was still a sinner. Jesus did not wait for me to change my opinion about illegal drugs before he loved me. Jesus did not wait for me to change my opinion about honoring or dishonoring my parents before he loved me. Jesus did not wait for me to change my opinion about sexual promiscuity before he loved me. He loved me when I was completely engulfed in and confused about all of those things. He accepted me despite all of those things. But hear this, when he accepted me, he didn't affirm all of those things. He disagreed with me. He said that I was wrong. He didn't affirm my lifestyle. But that doesn't mean that he was hateful. It doesn't mean that Jesus was a bigot. I promise you, you will never meet a man more loving than Jesus Christ of Nazareth. This man embraced and forgave prostitutes. I do not condemn you. And then he instructed them, go and sin no more. Friends, don't buy into the world's definition of love. The world says that in order to love somebody, you need to affirm that what they want and what they desire is good as long as it makes them happy. The world is saying that When you love somebody, you're going to support whatever it is that they think will make them happy. You do not have to use that definition of love. It's a bad definition of love. Fact is, sometimes people pursue things that they think are going to make them happy, but in the end, it's going to hurt them and it's going to hurt other people. Love is pursuing what is best for people and pursuing what is in the best interest of their eternal happiness, even if they don't realize it. That's how God loved us. While we were still sinners. And therefore, when we have a difference of opinion on this or any other moral issue, it doesn't necessarily imply hatred for homosexuals or their supporters. Just like Jesus, by his grace, you can disagree with somebody and still love them very, very deeply. So I have three points of application. Um, And we'll try to go quickly because I know we're getting long here. Number one, number one, I encourage you to stand firm in God's word. I encourage you to stand firm in God's word. We want to be sensitive. We want to be gentle. We want to try to use language that diffuses tension as much as we possibly can. Uh, Do not sound like a Fox News correspondent in the way that you address this issue. I'm trying not to. I probably do. It's not intentional. Okay. We, we want to have the courage, however, to, to, having to, to, to do our very best. We want, to, we want to try to diffuse the situation, but we want to have the courage, and we have to... We have to stand with God and uh, and his word uh, on this issue. Have courage. Take heart. Don't throw, you know, the next next time some major political, you know, advancement is made for the agenda and the pressure is high, don't throw an equal sign up on your Facebook, okay? Uh, I don't know if you guys remember that, but that's what was happening in 2013, okay? Um, Don't do that. Stand with Jesus. He'll stand with you. Stick with him. Uh, Because as long as you do, you won't end up on the wrong side of history, right? Because God is the final judge of history, not the American uh, media machine, okay? Stand firm in God's word. Second point of application, prepare to humbly endure under fire. Just be ready for it. Many will demand our tolerance on this issue and what, what that means Uh, is they will demand that we surrender our moral position on the issue, 
Okay? And ironically, they will not tolerate you if you don't do it. And because of that, we will, in all likelihood, we will suffer for this. And we'll be told we have a martyr complex if we say stuff like that. I could be wrong, but I honestly, I don't think the trajectory is going to shift on this one. I think we're only starting to taste the reality of what's coming. And there's a fire behind the issue, okay? There's a passion behind it. If you hold a biblical stance on homosexuality and a biblical view of marriage, even if you hold it quietly, at some point, most of us will be sniffed out. And you'll probably um, not be tolerated. And Christians and others uh, will um, be marginalized as a, as a result, okay? There's probably a lot of fire coming. And that's one of the reasons why I feel the need to talk about this. I want to encourage you to humbly endure under that, under that fire. Do not anticipate being treated charitably or lovingly. Do not anticipate being understood I would anticipate some level of rejection. It's hard not to think that's going to be the case it, when you're being called bigots. That's what, that's what you're being referred to if you believe what I've been saying. And when you are rejected and criticized, humbly endure. Do not bite back. Do not fight fire with fire. Do not get ugly. 1 Peter 3.14 But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake... You will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet, do it with gentleness and respect. Having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good that should be God's will, than for doing evil. So don't bite back. Don't become a hater when they call you a hater in the way that you respond to that. And the, ten the, the temptation will be huge, right? It makes you mad. You don't, you don't, you don't want this forced on you, and then you're, and then you're called a hater. And like, okay, just gentle gentle, respectful in the response. Prepare to humbly endure under fire. And number three, and I'll close with this, love those with whom you disagree. Love them. We must be people of such incredible love that when we are accused of hatred, it's the most asinine label imaginable. When the world pulls the hate card, trump the hate card, with a life of Christian love. Prove our love with our actions by the ways in which we suffer, the ways in which we dialogue, the ways in which we relate to people. Demonstrate that we really are people who genuinely care about the people that we disagree with. God showed His love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Let's show that same love to others even while they're still sinners. I think this is fair to say. I think historically speaking, if we evangelicals took Jesus as the model when it comes to the issue of homosexuality, I think it would be fair to say that we've done a good job of joining him in recognizing the sinfulness of homosexuality. Okay? Like I said, until very recently, it's the unanimous conclusion of the church throughout history, Catholic, Orthodox, Protestant, conservative, liberal, etc. Okay. But what about the second half of the verse? God shows his love for us in that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. How well are we doing at that with regards to this issue? We're willing to call it sin, but will we love homosexuals enough to die for them? Will we lay down our lives for them? Will we truly befriend them and serve them and love them? Will we evangelicals give any meaningful interaction with homosexuals that doesn't consist of carrying signs to the Capitol building? We have got to stop giving the gay community more and more reasons to think that our dominant sentiment towards them is that we and God hate fags. We've got to stop. 
So what does it take? What's it going to take to, to, to wipe away that image? It might take some spilled blood for them. That's what it might take. Would you die for a gay man? Because Jesus would. And Jesus did. So let's stand firm on God's word. And let's humbly endure under fire. And let's be certain that as God loved us, even when, we, when he disagreed with us, let's be certain that we too love others and lay our lives down for the ones that we disagreement, just disagree with. Disagreement about the morality of homosexuality does not necessarily imply hatred. And let's be so Loving that when we are slandered, it will be apparent to all that the label simply doesn't fit. Trump the hate card with a life of Christ-like, Bible-affirming, and self-sacrificing love. Amen. Let's